So you have the social studies test coming up. Yay! In this video here today, I am going to take a social studies practice test with you, which I believe is really one of the best ways to understand and pass the social studies test because you really get to become a little more familiar with the wording of the questions and you also get to hear what goes on in the teacher's brain to help answer those questions. Welcome to Purely Persistent, I'm Michelle. So before we get started, a couple of tips for you. First, make sure that you read the questions very, very carefully. Make sure that you know what they're asking for. I actually have a video here on how to pass a multiple choice test. So make sure you watch that video if you haven't already. Next, you want to make sure that you know what's on the social studies test. Now, you may not be studying exactly what is on the test, but just familiarizing yourself with the types of material that will be on the test. Because social studies is a reading test, you want to make sure that you know how to read efficiently. So I have more videos on that. My goodness, I just have a lot of videos for you. Finally, make sure that you stay until the end of this video. I know it's a long video, but the longer you watch, the more that will stick in your brain and help you pass the test. All right, here we go. More social studies practice. I do have another video like this, FYI. Okay. So here we have a picture of the earth. And as you can see, it is tilted. So at what point on the diagram of the earth is in the tropical zone? Okay, so we know the earth, right? We know that up at the top here, that's the North Pole. Down here is the South Pole. And then along this line here is the equator. And does the equator tend to be a little bit warmer? tropical. Yeah. So which one here would be in the tropical zone? Which one is closest to the earth crater? Looks like we have one here, which means A is the answer. Which of the following statements would be most difficult to prove or disprove? Okay, so notice here it says most difficult. So we have to keep that in mind. The United States should impose, okay, should impose. That's a little tricky to prove, but let's keep reading it. The United States should impose import taxes on goods from countries that do not allow access to their markets. Okay, so again, that word should makes it a little bit iffy, right? Proving and disproving, but let's keep reading the other ones and see. The United States does not impose any import taxes on European goods. Well, that's very clear to, you know, either we do or we don't. That's, that's definitely pretty clear. So that's easy to prove or disprove. Import taxes on goods from Latin America are lower today than they were five years ago. Again, that's going to be pretty easy to prove or disprove. Import taxes on farm machinery are greater than those on automobiles. Again, we could easily, if we wanted to research it, prove or disprove that. So A would be the answer. And again, it's all about the wording. Should, right? Should is an iffy word. So be mindful of your readings there. Which of the following is the best example of an investment of human resources? Okay, so human resources would be like people actually doing the work, okay? And an investment would be like the company paying maybe for people to do the work or paying for something for humans to actually do, no machines. So a company provides educational programs for its employees, well that's definitely a human investment, right? Company offers special discounts to some customers. Well, that's not really an investment for the employees, for the human resources, you know, it's handy for the customers. A customer buys stock in a newly formed company. 
again, the company is, it's not an investment of human resources, what the humans are doing. A company acquires a machine that can do the work of several people. No, that's an investment in a machine. It's not an investment in humans. So the answer would be A, a company provides educational programs for its employees. So guys, when you're looking for a job, definitely, you know, see what sort of investments they have in human resources. That would actually be a fabulous interview question. What type of investments do you make in human resources? Right? And they'll be like, huh? <laughs> the poster from World War One. The Navy needs you. Okay, so let's just sort of look and see what's going on here. So it looks like it says the Navy needs you. Don't read his American history. Make it. Woo. Okay, so it looks like here we have a guy in a suit reading a newspaper, which is kind of a typical image of World War II. Maybe he's like a business guy. He looks, I don't know, fairly young. And then we have someone from the Navy. We know he's from the Navy because of his outfit and because it says the Navy. So he's like, the Navy needs you. And he's like, you know, pointing out to the sea. Come, the Navy needs you, right? And what is he pointing out to? Looks like way in the distance here, we've got like a ship on some rough waters. And then we have a lady in the back. She is probably supposed to represent Lady Liberty. And there's the American flag. It's a very patriotic poster. It kind of is heartwarming. It makes, makes men want to join the Navy, right? So in the poster, the man with the newspaper most likely represents, and we just, we just did this, right? So newspaper reporters, no, he's reading the newspaper. He's not reporting on it, right? Former veterans, no. Potential recruits, right? The Navy guy is like, hey, let's recruit you. Probably that member of Congress, no. The poster was most likely designed to appeal to all of the following except a person's. Okay, is it a desire for adventure? Yes, look at the seas, right? So he's, it's not, that's not the exception. A feeling of patriotism? Look at the American flag, right? That's about as patriotic as it gets. A sense of responsibility, you know, don't read American history. You need to make it. It's your responsibility to make it. A need for financial security. Nothing in here talks about financial security. So that's our answer because it says except. Which of the following actions would probably not be protected by the constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech and freedom of the press? Okay. So a newspaper columnist falsely accusing a city official of stealing funds. Well, that would be called lying and that's not exactly freedom of speech or freedom of press, right? So it wouldn't necessarily be protected by that, but let's just keep reading. A senator questioning the qualifications of a, potent, of a presidential appointee. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. You have, you have the freedom of press you can question, right? Or speech. A radio commentator raising doubts about the ability of a political candidate. Yep, they do that and they can do that. Freedom of speech, freedom of press. An editorial writer criticizing the policies of a police chief. Again, same thing. But A is, is like downright falsely accusing. It's lying and that's not protect. That's not a constitutional guarantee. Hey, you can lie and we'll protect you. No. That is not okay. No, no. Okay, which of the following locations would be expected to have the most hours of sunlight on January 15th? Okay. Whew. Now, wait a second. Didn't we already read one that kind of showed, give us kind of a little clue? Yes, look at this. So this was in the test already. So we're pretty handy that we have this image from a previous question that we can look at to help us better answer this question. Okay, so I am located in the United States. And so I know 
that I am in the north. And when I am in the north, it tends to be very dark on January 15th. So the most hours of sunlight would not be a place that is in the north, but just from my own experience, right? And so look, here you can see that 10 degrees south is probably somewhere, somewhere like this, right? And then 50 degrees south would probably be something like this. So if you've ever done any traveling in the summer or the winter, the closer to the, the summer solstice or the winter solstice, the either the darker or the lighter it is. Like in Alaska, in the summertime, it is so sunny and they're like cabbages grow huge because there's so much sunlight. Whereas if you're in the continental United States, like you're gonna be experiencing, you know, regular nighttime and your cabbages won't get to be so big. So from that, we know that the further south it is, January 15th is pretty close to the winter solstice. So they would be experiencing more sunlight. So the answer is gonna be D. Which statement about a candidate running for president would be the most difficult to prove or disprove? Okay, so this is kind of like one that we answered before about proving and disproving. Okay, A, candidate A visited all 50 states in the last year. Yeah, they could be like, all right, he visited Wisconsin on, you know, this day and Oklahoma on this day, New Jersey on this day. That'd be pretty easy to prove, right? And we're looking here for most difficult. Okay, candidate A has a more reasonable stance on taxes than candidate B. Notice here, oh, it says reasonable stance. What does reasonable stance mean? It's really the perspective of whomever is reading or listening, right? So uh, let's keep reading them. Candidate B voted in favor of a bill that would raise income tax rates. Yes, that's very easy. He voted for that. Candidate B has received more campaign contributions than candidate A. Yeah, this guy received, you know, $3 million and this guy received like $3,000, right? Very easy to prove. So that leaves us with B for our answer. Which of the following people would be least likely to favor a city's proposed downtown redevelopment plan? Someone who is financing a new office building in the downtown area. Okay, so the downtown redevelopment plan is, let's think about our downtown and let's make it spiffy. Let's make this downtown look really awesome. So if someone has an office building, of course they're gonna be like, yeah, let's make this place better. And then I'll get more business. It sounds great. So they're, they're not going to be least likely to, right? A member of the city board that recommended the project. Of course he's gonna be in favor of it, right? A longtime resident of an apartment building targeted for demolition. He's gonna be like, I don't want this. I don't wanna be evicted and then have my apartment built, you know, torn down. It's gonna be a work project for me, right? So D, a partner of in the architectural firm that would develop the proposed plan. Yeah, he was like, I'm gonna get some business. I'm gonna get some money. So it would be C, the poor, poor guy there is getting kicked out. So if you're still watching right now, I want you to give this video a thumbs up because that really shows me that you are committed and then you are going to pass this test. I believe in you. Make sure you believe in yourself too. All right, so the next several questions relate to this passage, these two letters. Many citizens are concerned about the relatively low percentage of registered voters who actually cast a ballot in official elections. To increase participation, some government officials are proposing that voting by mail be, be permitted. The following are two letters to the editor of a newspaper concerning the proposal. Letter one. In recent elections, voter turnout in our state has been sparse. Even though the polls are open for 12 hours, eligible voters don't show up. One proposed solution is to allow voting by mail in 
one state where ballots were mailed to each voter, participation in the general election soared from an average of about 20% to approximately 75%. When an issue is passed or defeated with a 20% voter turnout, officials don't know if the outcome reflects the people's true opinions or just their indifference. When it is passed or defeated by 75% of the eligible voters, their will is clear. Voting by mail also decreased cost. In one state, cost declined about $2.22 per voter in a conventional election to 76 cents per vote in an election by mail. Mail elections would also make voting easier for older people and people with disabilities. In general, voting by mail is a good way to increase voter participation. Letter two. Voting by mail is a step in the wrong direction. Equal representation under law was a hard-won privilege. A person who doesn't bother going to the polls doesn't deserve to vote. Voting by mail will bypass safeguards that are in effect at voting places. Currently, election workers at the polls ensure the integrity of the voting process. Precautions are taken to make sure that each person casts only one vote. If voting is done by mail, will the ballot pass through, the, through many hands? If it does, how will a ballot remain confidential? Decisions made by voting involves people's money and lives, matters that are too important to jeopardize merely for the sake of convenience. Okay, so what is the primary purpose of both letters? to describe a growing political problem? Is this a political problem? No, I mean, it's an issue, but it's not a political problem. To persuade others to share the author's point of view. Yeah, the A is like, let's do mail-in ballots. B is, or letter two is like, no, let's not do mail-in ballots. C, to provide data regarding trends in voter participation. Uh, no, that's not their purpose to praise the principles on which our electoral system is based? No. So the answer is B. Letter one supports the argument for mail-in ballots with a nationwide study. No, it doesn't have a nationwide study. I mean, it said in one state, you know, but that's not nationwide. An opinion poll of voters no, it's not, it didn't really talk about that. Examples of how the system worked elsewhere. Yeah, it does talk about how it worked and that sort of thing. And a testimony from an expert witness. No, it's just really talking about it, how it worked in other places. Which of the following statements best summarizes the opinions expressed in letter two about voting by mail? It will be successful only for a, shor only for a short time. No, it doesn't talk about that. It will never appeal to, appeal to truly patriotic people. Oh my gosh, you guys, I mail in my ballot. I must not be patriotic. <laughs> it will become too expensive to maintain. It doesn't talk about cost, right? It's just saying it's too easy to corrupt. That's the main point of letter two. Which of the following statements from the letters is not a statement of opinion? Letter one, one proposed solution is to allow voting by mail. Is that a, an opinion? Are they like, you know, maybe, maybe vote by mail? That's my opinion. My opinion is it's best to vote by mail. No, I mean, it's, it's not an opinion. So we'll just hold it. Okay, in general, voting by mail is a good way. So here it says good, good way. Again, words like that are kind of not very concrete. So that's not it. Voting by mail is a step in the wrong direction, right? That's his, his opinion, step in the wrong direction. Decisions made by voting involve people's money and lives. Matters are too important to jeopardize merely for the sake of convenience, right? So that's his opinion as well. So the only one that doesn't have the opinion is one proposed solution is this. Both letter one and letter two are concerned with the aspects of a voter privacy, 
A doesn't really talk about privacy, right? Honesty? I mean, neither one really talks about honesty, right? Education, it, you know, it doesn't talk about education. So representation. So letter one is yes, if we do mail-in ballots, more people will vote. Whereas B is like, it's going, people are going to be corrupt. It's not going to be okay, right? So, but they're both talking about representation. Letter two suggests that each voter should make an effort to cast a vote in person. Yeah, they're like, this is what you need to do. You need to vote in person. Try different voting procedures. No, they're like, vote in person. Discuss his or her vote with others. No, vote who you want to vote for. Be open-minded about voting methods. No, this person is not open-minded. They're like, it's this way or not at all. So it's A, vote in person. Which of the following is not one of the points letter one makes in favor of allowing voting by mail. It is less expensive. Okay, so, so we're looking here again for not. It's less expensive. It talked about how it's less expensive, right? It's significantly, look, $2.22 versus 76 cents, significantly less expensive. The majority participation is more likely. Look at that, 75%. Yes, so that's not it. The confidentiality of every vote is assured, that they didn't really talk about. Special populations can vote more easily. Yeah, I talked about that, right? Um, older people and people with disabilities. So that leaves us with the answer of C, the confidentiality of every vote is, ass is assured. And so I think that a lot of the voter disputes that have happened, especially with presidential elections lately, have kind of been be because of this, right? The confidentiality, I mean, someone can vote for, you know, they can take someone else's ballot and vote for them. I mean, that's one issue, but look at all the positives that that go with it. I mean, you, you win some, you lose some. What's, what's more important? I think that's what they're trying to figure out. Okay, so the next several that we have here relate to this one here. The 1930s and 40s were turbulent years in the United States history. This passage considers the impact of the Great Depression and Second World War on the United States economy. The United States economy in the 1930s and 1940s. During the administration of Herbert Hoover and Franklin D. Roosevelt, Poverty was widespread. The Great Depression had dealt a severe blow to the economic well-being of the nation. For example, the gross national product, GNP, a total value of all goods and services produced in a year, had dropped from $103 billion in 1929 to $55 billion in 1933. Full recovery from the Depression did not come until the end of the Second World World War, when the United States industry went into high gear producing war materials to enable the Allied armies to win the war in both Europe and the Pacific, technological miracles were achieved. Employment rose as factories worked around the clock. High wages and government controlled prices helped create a tremendous growth in family incomes. Because of the emphasis on production of heavy goods and machinery, much of the money people earned went into savings, measured in dollars of constant purchasing power or what economists call real income. The average yearly take-home pay of families rose by about $800 from 1941 to 1946, an increase of about $160 per year. Dire predictions about mass employment after war proved wrong. In the peacetime economy and industry flourished as price controls were removed and manufacturers scrambled to meet the huge demand for consumer goods. The recessions during the 20 years after, sorry, there were recessions during the 20 years after the war, but they were minor economic ripples compared to the previous national depressions. Which of the following would be the best example of the type of consumer goods that were in demand in the second when the Second World War ended. Okay, so we're talking about consumer goods here. So let's just 
eliminate what's not a consumer good, right? So a consumer good is something that we purchase, something that we buy. Do we buy automobiles? Yeah. Do we buy better highways? No, we don't we don't buy highways, right? Hey, that's my highway. I own it. No. Do we buy commercial airlines? Airplanes? No, the companies do. Do we buy railroad passenger cars? No, those are all essentially services that that we pay for. So the only consumer good that we would buy or that consumers would have bought would have been automobiles. According to the passage, which of the following was was primarily responsible for the end of the Great Depression? Federal anti-poverty programs. It doesn't really talk about that in, in here. Technological progress, you know, there, there was, but it, it's not the, that the technological pro was, um, was not responsible for the end of the Great Depression. Government controls over prices and wages, that did not end the Great Depression. The development of a war economy, that's what ended the Great Depression because we developed this war economy, people were getting jobs, that that sort of thing. And that is what ended the Great Depression. Then people had money coming in, people were going overseas and were receiving stipends, that sort of thing. Which of the following would be the best example of a technological miracle achieved during the Second World War? The, adver- the use of advertising to sell huge numbers of war bonds so a war bond is kind of like a, a savings bond. So here, here's a piece of paper and you that's valued at a certain amount of money and you, you give us some money. And then we'll, this is a war bond which will help us pay for the war. Now our country just goes into trillion dollars of debt. <laughs> different time, people, different time. Uh, so that's, that's not a technological miracle, right? That's not technology. The development of a rationing system for distributing good. So a rationing system, think about when COVID first started and there was a rationing of toilet paper, right? Okay, you can only get two things of toilet paper and that's it, right? So there was, there was rationing. Is that a technological miracle? No, it's you put up a sign and then people follow it. It's, it has nothing to do with technological miracle. Okay, the invention of radon. It's kind of a biggie, right? And technological miracle, I would say so, but let's look at D. The implementation of price controls. This toilet paper is only going to cost you $85. No more. (laughs) No, that's not it. So the answer is C. According to the passage, the $800 increase in real income enjoyed by the average family between 1941 and 1946 was primarily the result of inflation. No, inflation means that things cost more. It doesn't mean that people start to have more. Government subsidies. No, I mean, they're putting people to work, right? Decreases in taxes. No. Didn't talk about taxes. Re- rising wages and government controlled prices. There we go. Based on the information in the passage, it could be concluded that an important factor in the growth of the United States economy in the middle of the 20th century was inflation. Again, we just talked about that, the, how that means things cost more. So, you know, maybe like a, a bottle of Coca-Cola, you know, back in this time era, you know, was a nickel, right? And now a bottle of Coke that you might buy at Walmart is now like $2, right? At the cash register. So that's because of inflation. Inflation is making things increase in, in prices. So that's, that's not really, that's not it. Okay. The rise of consumer spending after the war. Yeah, I mean, that definitely is an important 
growth factor of the economy. People are spending more money. They're putting money into the economy. That's actually one reason why we received those stimulus checks during, during the COVID time, because not enough, a lot of people lost their jobs and the government gave us the stimulus checks so that we would spend the money to keep our economy flourishing. So a lot of people during World War II, it said, you know, they were kind of saving, saving their money, right? Here it says uh, much of the money people earned went into savings. The war ended and then they started spending the money and the economy increased. So the answer is B, but let's look at the other ones here. A change in the ownership of many businesses that, in, that has nothing to do with the rising economy. The development of economic indicators such as GDP. So they talked about GDP here and they talked about it in 1929 and 1933. And so the development of the economic indicators like that really don't have anything specifically to do with the economy flourishing. That's just a way to track it. So these questions here came from the High Set Free Practice Test 7. And you did it. You stayed until the end. I knew you would because you are awesome. And I believe in you. Make sure that you believe in yourself too. And comment below and tell me when are you taking the social studies test? I'm so excited for you. And also let me know that you stayed all the way until the end. You believe in yourself. Have a beautiful day and check out some of these other videos I have that are just like this one, but for other subjects. Bye guys. Peace. Love you. Love you.